Yeah, I mean, I'm just, I'm so excited for this upcoming season. I mean, fresh off the conference finals, first real postseason success in Luca's career. You know, I, I know we lost Jalen Brunson, but it's all downhill from here, man. It's about to be an incredible season. <laughs> what are you guys, why are you guys looking at me like that? I don't, what's going on? Huh? Stay strong, brother. You know, after last season, wins, losses, it's just a stupid game at the end of the day. And just uh, take it a day at a time, I guess. Just just, uh, just happy to be on this earth, really. It's just really how I approach every day. Jesus Christ, what the hell is about to happen to me this season? Okay, look, guys, I wasn't going to say anything. I, I don't want you guys to get too anxious, but June 2024, make sure you guys mark off your calendars. That's all I'm going to tell you, okay? That's all I'm going to say. Clear out you, June. Are you oh, that good. You're not joking? That's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. That is good. Yeah, so I'm feeling pretty good about this upcoming season for the Mavericks, okay? But I, I am a little scarred and I'm a little bit scared to look over at 2025 because I'm I don't know what we're gonna see. Okay, well uh, at least he's been going to the gym, so we, we have that working in our favor. Oh my god, he has a fing cigar. Okay. okay. Now that's interesting. He's too good to talk to us. <laughs> that, that, can only, that can only be one thing. That can only be one thing. Hey! Chandler Parsons, baby. We trade for a point guard. We're going all the way this year, baby. All the way. Folks, if you think you're excited for this upcoming Dallas Mavericks season, I'm here to tell you right now, you're not excited. Because I'm actually excited. You're something else. You're something underexcited. Because you're nowhere near as excited as me. Why am I excited? Well, of course, the Dallas Mavericks came off of making the NBA Finals last year, winning the Western Conference against all odds. But the reason I'm so excited is because I think in a lot of ways, this Dallas Mavericks basketball team got better. And I do think they have a very good chance of making it back to the NBA Finals, or at the very least, making a very deep postseason run in the Western Conference. I'm going to talk about some of the reasons why I think they have a great shot at another deep postseason run, and anytime we talk about a deep postseason run, anytime we talk about the Mavericks, you have to start with the number one factor, Luka fucking... All right, I'm coming back. This is me from the future. I've just recorded for 15 minutes. I thought this video was going terribly because I spent too much time talking about Luka Doncic and Kyrie Irving. Look, the, the fact of the matter is, what the fuck do you need me to tell you about those guys? Huh? You need me to hold your hand? You need me to hold your hand and tell you how good those guys are? Of course you don't need me to do that. I, I don't think you're an idiot. The biggest reason why the Dallas Mavericks have a great chance at making another deep postseason run is because those two are on the roster. Luka Doncic is arguably the best player on the planet. I think he is the best player on the planet. Offensively, he's one of the greatest offensive engines the league has ever seen. Kyrie Irving is one of the most skilled guards the league has ever seen. Their synergy was off the charts last year. Those two are incredible together. Those two are incredible by themselves. You don't need me to tell you that even though I just did, basically. The real reason why the Dallas Mavericks are in a prime position to contend once again is the roster around those two. And that really is the main talking point. We have to talk about Clay. As of the time I'm recording this, he's a hot topic of conversation. He just went 0 of 9 in his last preseason game. Again, as of the time I'm recording this, uh, very very fortunate he didn't take another shot. We didn't need another 0 of 10 stinker. But it does feel good that Clay's getting those out of the way early on. That's a big positive. Clay's getting those out of the way early on. I also think Mavericks fans should be a little bit prepared. He is a notoriously slow starter in seasons. 36 career games in October. He averages 34% from three in those games. So just take it a little bit easy if Clay's off to a slow start. But the floor spacing that this guy is going to provide is just going to open up so many things for the Dallas Mavericks offensively. We know this is a Mavericks team that likes to bomb threes. And last year was really no different. Over the course of last season, 41% of the Dallas Mavericks shots were three-pointers. That was second, trailing only the Boston Celtics. But the reason the Celtics were first in offensive rating last year while the Mavericks were eighth is because the Celtics were second in three-point shooting accuracy while the Mavs were 11th. And from the trade deadline onwards, the Mavericks were 15th in three-point shooting accuracy. I think the more damning number is the corner three-point accuracy. This Mavericks team is going to generate so many corner threes. It's what they do. It's what they've done in the entire Luka era. He generates so much attention. They spam that high pick and roll. Players have to help off their guy in the corner. That leads to wide open threes. That leads to kickouts. That leads to skip passes, which Luka Doncic is so good at. 12% of their threes last year were corner threes. That was the most in the NBA. Unfortunately, they only shot 34% from the corner from the trade deadline onwards. That was second to last. That's a lot of points that are left on the table there. When you start to imagine a world where Clay Thompson, who shot 40% from the corner last year, 40 plus percent on catch and shoot threes, when you imagine he's the guy who's taking that shot, or Quentin Grimes, who shot 44% on corner threes just two seasons ago, 
on the Knicks. Or even Najee Marshall, who was 42% from the corner last year. A guy who you don't really think of as a sharpshooter, 42% on corner threes a season ago. You start to imagine a world where this Dallas Mavericks offense is going to be humming. And one of the big concerns about Klay Thompson I've seen throughout his preseason game so far is that his shot creation doesn't look great. He's not going to be able to create offense for himself. He can't generate separation anymore. That's not what the Dallas Mavericks brought him in to do. He is a force multiplier for Kyrie Irving and Luka Doncic. He's going to make life so much easier for those two. The floor spacing that he provides, just the headache it's going to cause defenses who want to help. Luka Doncic sees more double teams than anybody in the NBA. When Kyrie Irving's on the floor without Luka Doncic, he sees a ton of double teams. It's going to be so difficult for defenses to rotate, to help, to double, when you have a guy like Klay Thompson ready to catch and shoot threes. And for those of you saying Klay Thompson can't be a third option, that's that's not what he got brought in to be. Okay, The third option for the Mavericks is going to be, and probably will always be, as long as Luka Doncic is there, their center position. It's, it's not one specific player. It's not Derek Lively. It's not Daniel Gafford. It's both of them. It's whoever's out there. Just the nature of how this Dallas Mavericks offense operates. So many pick and rolls, high pick and rolls. The occasional dribble handoff. We, we've seen glimpses in the preseason of the Mavericks operating out of the high posts with Gafford or Lively initiating. The centers on the court are going to be the third most productive offensive player next to Luka and Kyrie. And that's another reason to be bullish about this Mavericks team. They might have one of the best center tandems in the entire NBA. I mean, this screenshot right here from B-Ball Index is hilarious. The top 10 centers in true shooting percentage, Daniel Gafford, number one, Derek Lively, number two. Of course, it pays to play next to Luka Doncic. Literally, these guys are going to get paid a lot of fucking money because they're great next to Luka. But it also just goes to show how well these two fit in this offensive system. Derek Lively's 20 years old, folks. He's going to get better. He's going to get more comfortable. He's going to develop a better offensive game. I don't know if that means a jump shot. I don't know if that means a three-point shot. I made a video talking about Derek Lively a few days ago, so I'm not going to go too deep into it. But what's more important for the Mavericks, he's going to develop a better understanding of what to do with the ball in his hands. He's going to get more comfortable in the short roll. His touch around the rim is going to get better. These are things you're going to see play out this season, not four or five years from now, right now. And by the way, Daniel Gafford is 26 years old. It's not like he's an old geezer. It's not like he's a grandpa. He's still growing and developing as a player. In a full year next to Luka and Kyrie Irving, he's also going to learn. He's also going to grow. He's also going to get continue to get better as this lethal pick and roll threat. So when defenses have to worry about the self-creation Luke and Kyrie bring to the table, and uh, they're going to do a lot of self-creating. I mean, the Mavericks will isolate more than any other team in basketball this season, guaranteed. Why do they do that? Because they're good at it. But when defenses have to be worried about the advantages those two create, when defenses have to be worried about two elite pick and roll threats, now defenses also have to be worried about a 40% high volume three-point shooter who's ready to knock down open threes the moment he gets a chance, who has a very quick release, when they also have to worry about a guy in Quentin Grimes who, according to some numbers, has the fourth quickest release in basketball, and as I mentioned earlier, was 44% from the corner a couple of seasons ago with the Knicks, also has to worry about Najee Marshall, who shot 38% from three last year. The big thing the Mavericks have done in the past couple of years is those guys I just mentioned, their catch and shoot numbers, their corner three numbers, those guys also provide more to your offense than just catch and shooting. That's been the problem in the Luka Doncic era, and we saw that kind of play out last year in the finals with guys like Derrick Jones Jr., where when the defense doesn't help off of you and the defense is forcing you to do something, are you capable of doing it? We saw with Dorian Finney-Smith. I love the guy to death. Not really capable of doing it. Reggie Bullock in that Western Conference Finals run. Not really capable of doing much else offensively other than catch and shoot the ball. Clay Thompson, Quentin Grimes, Najee Marshall, P.J. Washington. And then if you want to tap into the guard depth, Spencer Dinwiddie, Jaden Hardy, Dante Exum. These guys are capable of doing more offensively for you than just catch and shooting. They can rip and go. They can attack closeouts. They can create for themselves from time to time in, in advantageous matchups. P.J. Washington has a float game, a little post game that he likes going to. That's effective. Quentin Grimes has shown plenty of flashes throughout his young career of self-creation. It's not the most consistent thing in the world. It's something that's still developing but he's shown flashes of it. Najee Marshall has the ball skills and the playmaking skills to act as a secondary playmaker. That is a role that he had with the New Orleans Pelicans. This offense starts to look nightmarish. It's it's pick your poison, and there's a whole lot of poison. I just, I look around the Western Conference. There's a lot of great teams. There's a lot of great offenses. There's a lot of great offensive players. Shea Gildas Alexander, Anthony Edwards, Nikola Jokic, obviously. The more I dive into this team, I, I don't know if there's an offense I'll feel more comfortable with down the stretch of games than this Dallas Mavericks team. It's a reason why they were so incredible in crunch time last year. It's a reason why it felt like every single series in the playoffs up until the Celtics series, obviously, it felt like they had the advantage when the game got close and the game was tight and it was down the stretch. It felt comfortable. It felt like they were going to win because they had the better offense. They were better suited 
for playing down the stretch of postseason games than any other team. And I think they've just added to that strength with some of the play, some of the pieces that they've brought in. The concern for this team is, and probably will always be during the Luka era, the defense, right? Is this defense going to be good enough to make a, another championship push? Over the last 20 games of the season last year, which isn't a nothing sample size, but it's also not something that I think we can base everything off of. They were, by defensive rating, a top two defense in the NBA. They were very good in the postseason. They did their job. The concern is that a big piece of that was Derek Jones Jr., who was a very big piece of this Mavericks defense. There's a reason why he was a starter, despite his offensive struggles. There's a reason why it was difficult to get him off the court in games where he was providing zero for you offensively. That's because he was consistently picking up the opposing team's best player. He's the 99th percentile when it came to matchup difficulty. The Mavs defense was three and a half points per 100 possessions better when he was on the court versus when he was off the court. The concern is that the Mavericks won't find somebody who's able to replace this. And while the offense might be incredible, while starting five of Luka, Kyrie, Clay, P.J. Washington, and Derek Lively or Daniel Gafford is just mauling teams offensively, they just can't generate enough stops defensively for it to really matter. And they're going to have to switch up their lineup. It's a valid concern, right? But I will point out the fact that prior to the trade deadline, the Mavericks defense was bad even with Derrick Jones Jr. on the court. It wasn't until the trade deadline where the Mavericks prioritized size going out and getting a bigger P.J. Washington instead of a smaller Grant Williams and getting a big center in Daniel Gafford to plug into the rotation that the Mavericks defense really took off. The Mavericks defense with P.J. Washington and Derrick Jones Jr. sharing the court together a 103 defensive rating. I mean, that's that's incredible. That's very elite. Derrick Jones Jr. without P.J. Washington, a 118 defensive rating. That's not very good. Interestingly enough, P.J. Washington without Derrick Jones Jr., a 115 defensive rating. The Mavs defensive scheme, and we saw it all postseason long, it's everybody's on a string. Everyone's moving. Everyone's rotating. We're going to funnel drivers into our rim protectors, and we're going to we're going to defend kickouts. We're going to fly around the court. That's a strenuous type of defense to play over the course of an 82-game season, and there will be nights where the Mavericks just don't bring it defensively and they get absolutely torched. That's a guarantee. It's going to happen. But I do think there will be enough level of buy-in from everybody involved coming off of a trip to the finals, knowing what this team is capable of doing, that this defense will be fine. And in terms of point of attack defense, in terms of finding somebody who can guard the other team's best players, they do have options on the roster for that. Najee Marshall is more than capable of handling that role if he gets plugged into the starting lineup or is in closing lineups guarding the other team's best player. Quentin Grimes is somebody who can handle that role, assuming we're talking about the opposing player being a guard like Shea Gildas Alexander or Anthony Edwards. He's capable of handling that. He's shown that throughout his career. That's one of the few things and, and few things that he's been consistent at throughout his young career so far. This is a deep team, and that's going to matter in the regular season when you deal with injuries, when you deal with rest and guys being tired. This is a roster where, I mean, only a year ago going into the season or two years ago, you looked at the Dallas Mavericks roster and you said, how many guys on this team am I comfortable with in a 16-game setting, in a postseason setting? Six, maybe seven, we can maybe get there. And if we have one injury to one of those guys, we're fucked. You look at this roster now and it's eight, nine, ten guys who, if they get minutes in a postseason setting, you feel decent about, you feel comfortable with. I know there wasn't much structure to this video. I literally decided last second, let me, let me just put something out there. Let me put something into the universe. I had a dream last night about the Dallas Mavericks. Okay. I dream about working my sleep. So I decided, you know what? Let's just, let's put something out there for the world to see. The main reasons why I'm excited for the Mavericks this upcoming season, their offense is going to be incredible. I think defensively they'll put it together. Derek Lively is really blossoming into one of the league's premier centers. And I think we'll see that on full display this upcoming season. Luca's never had this many weapons. He just hasn't in his career. I mean, it's, it's not even close. Like this roster is so much better. It's so much more talented and deep than anything else we've seen in the Luca era. And I, I cannot wait to see how the season unfolds. Let me know what you guys think. A bosh.